The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism. Inflation just hit 7.7%. That hasn't happened in decades. And there's no way to sugarcoat the continuing upward march of prices on all manner of goods. Can anyone fix this? We'll examine that tonight. First up, as part of our ongoing partnership with the Council of the Great Lakes Region, we'll look at what the powerhouse cross-border economic region needs to thrive. It's Monday, June 27th, and that's next on The Agenda. Trillions in economic activity, millions of jobs on both sides of the border. If the provinces and states surrounding the Great Lakes were a country, that country would be one of the biggest economies on the planet. With us now for more from this year's Great Lakes Economic Forum taking place in Chicago, Illinois, we welcome Heather Mulligan. She's president and chief executive officer of the Business Council of New York. And Mark Fisher is here. He's president and CEO of the Council of the Great Lakes Region. We are partnered with them all this year as part of our efforts to commemorate the 50th anniversary of the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement between the United States and Canada. And Mark and Heather, it's great to have you on TVO tonight. Mark, maybe you can just start us off by telling, telling everybody why the Great Lakes are so important uh, and so valuable to Canada. Let's start there. Thanks for having me, Steve, and uh, for covering the Great Lakes Economic Forum this year. We're really pleased to be hosting the forum in Chicago after two years of the pandemic and getting back into in-person events. Uh, this region to the United States and Canada is a critically important region. As you mentioned off the top, you know, if you were to put the eight states together, New York to Minnesota, as well as the Canadian provinces of Ontario and Quebec, the regional economy is worth roughly six trillion dollars so that would make this region the third largest economy in the world behind giants like the united states and china and ahead of economies like japan and the uk and germany um, it's a region that uh, supports roughly 50 million jobs or one third of the combined canadian and american workforce and you know we also have uh, roughly i'd say more than 50 percent of the total trade value that goes across the border every year is a direct result of uh, doing business in the great lakes region so hugely important economic region to both countries when we think about it in the canadian context and just ontario alone one in three canadians uh, live in the great lakes basin uh, predominantly obviously ontario 40 percent of canada's economic activity is derived from doing business, um, you know, in this in in Ontario, in this in this region, and just to put some uh, further importance on this, um, you know, 30% of Ontario's GDP is directly derived from doing business across the borders with the eight Great Lakes states and a little bit beyond with some of the uh, the other states in in uh, in the United States of America. So it's an incredibly important uh, economy for both countries, particularly Canada and particularly Ontario. Heather, I guess when you're asked or when skeptical people say to you, what's the big deal with the Great Lakes, what do you tell them? Uh, well, first, I, I tell them that it's an incredibly important component of the U.S. economy um, and that the cross, the regional and cross-border trade supports hundreds of thousands of jobs um, and keeps this a viable place for people to live um, affordably and in a beautiful, uh, beautiful climate and uh, employers have access to a really fantastic, robust workforce, first-class higher education. Um, and so altogether, it, it makes the region extremely important to the U.S. economy. Heather, you just said beautiful climate, and I know you've been to Buffalo in the wintertime, so how can you say that, really? I love the snow. I grew up in Syracuse. Um, <laughs> But but yeah. relatively speaking, this this part of the country actually, you know, save a few weeks, maybe months of winter. Um, during the summer, it's wonderful. Um, during the fall, it's wonderful. During the spring, it's actually very livable and affordable. We don't have uh, forest fires or um, you know a lot of earthquakes or anything like that. It's 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 really in the world a very very nice place. I get you. I was being a little facetious there, but yeah. I, so I have frozen my hiney off far too many times in, uh, in in Buffalo's football stadium to watch the Bills. So that's another story for another day. Tell me this though, uh, Heather. I got a feeling that if you stop the first hundred people on the streets of either you know anywhere New York or anywhere Ontario. Despite the fact that we've had an agreement in place for half a century, they, they may not appreciate uh, 
And this goes for political leaders as well. They may not appreciate the significance of the Great Lakes to our collective, uh, ne never mind economic activity, but just our, our you know, mental health and uh, outdoors and all of that. Why do you think that is the case? Yeah, I think this whole region of the country maybe needs a, a good therapist, so we don't always appreciate what's around us. Um, but, but but really, I mean, the, the jobs uh, that are created and supported by the, um, the economy in this part of the country really support the rest of the country as well. Um, but it's a great, as I mentioned, it's a great place to live and to work, um, very affordable high quality education, um, excellent higher education, great place to start a business if you're looking for skilled workforce. So, I mean, all around, it really, uh, it, it really is a wonderful place. Mark, I'm going to give you sort of the conventional wisdom of the la or of much of the last half century, and then you're going to tell me where I'm running afoul here, okay? Here's the, here's the conventional wisdom, that Canadians tend to do better, economically speaking, when there's a Republican in the White House, because at least before Donald Trump, Republicans were not protectionist. They believed in freer trade. And that usually meant that Canada did well, economically speaking. Democrats tended to be more protectionist, and therefore we did less well when Democrats were in the White House. Uh, okay, that calculus changed under Donald Trump. How are things going so far under Joe Biden? Well, I think the, to your point, I think the assumption is that Democrats are more favorable to, to Canada generally, um, but that's certainly not the case that we're seeing in the last couple of years, whether it's uh, presidency under Donald Trump, but I would see even under President Biden, uh, there's certainly a lot of tension, there's still a lot of friction on, on a number of issues, whether it's by America, by American, uh, energy issues, food issues, um, you know, even if we have an, a new trade agreement, the USMCA or COSMA in Canada, there's still a lot of friction and tension in the relationship, even under a Democratic president that is um, certainly supportive of, of Canada and, and, and that relationship. And, and that has been worsening, I think, over the last decade. Um, and, and there are some real issues that we, we have to, to navigate. Um, you know, we had a great opening keynote from a former U.S. Ambassador Bruce Heyman this morning. And I think it's fair to say, from my perspective, that in many ways, the relationship feels like we're drifting further apart and not coming together on a range of different economic issues. When we look at the rest of the world, we need to be figuring out how we can compete and win together uh, you know, in that global economy. So uh, I think under, under both Republican and Democratic presidents over the last decade, we've certainly seen too much friction that we need to, we need to resolve and, and start working more closely together on a range of issues, particularly in the Great Lakes region, which again is, is North America's economic engine. And so when this region doesn't work for both countries, um, that's a real problem. And we're starting to see a lot of tension and friction in this region, whether it's EVs and the auto sector, uh, you know, how do we how do we do more trade along the St. Lawrence Seaway, which is a system we built 50 years ago? Um, you know, there's there's just a lot of work we need to be doing to reset this relationship for the next 50 years. OK, Heather, I guess in the interest of equal time, I should ask you the same question, which is, do Americans feel they do better when there's a liberal government in power in Canada or a conservative government in power in Canada? I don't know the answer to that question at all, but I can tell you this. I think there's been a lot of missed opportunities, um, particularly of late, in, in trying to um, sort of leverage the relationship between the two countries. For example, we, we could have uh, avoided some of the problems that we're having with gas pricing if we had had more discussion with Canada up front about that. Um, I also think um, semiconductor industry is a, is a logical area where we could have a stronger partnership um, in accessing some of the materials, the rare earth materials that are available in Canada, rather than going uh, to uh, overseas countries that maybe aren't as politically friendly to the U.S. Hmm. Let me ask you, uh, you know, one of the irritants, obviously, since COVID has been the relative thickness or thinness of the border. And uh, I guess I want to know, for starters, Heather, in your judgment, is the border still too thick? Is it thin enough for your liking? Talk to us about that. I mean, in my in, in my judgment, it would be great if the border was completely open. There is so much cross-border trade between New York and Canada, um, and I, I think New York exports $17 billion worth of goods and services to Canada annually. Uh, that number could be higher if if we had um, basically a, an invisible border. Uh, okay, when you say invisible border to Canadians, th th there are some red flags that go up because, of course, uh, you're talking about from a business point of view, and Canadians exactly. get very 
concerned about uh, losing cultural sovereignty and that kind of thing. So I will put that to Mark. Mark, in terms of the, the thickness or thinness of the border, either economically, culturally, in terms of sovereignty, whatever, how are we doing on that front? Well, I think there's there's been two big events that we've had to deal with as it relates to the border. Obviously, the big one was was 9-11. We saw an immediate thickening of the border around that time, and it took years and years and years to remove some of that, that thickness at the border pandemic. Um, and those public health measures obviously has, has really brought back some of the thickness that we've chipped away at uh, over the last number of years. And so there are some real issues there in terms of how we're moving people and goods across the border. And as, as Heather said, um, you know, that the, the fluidity of that border and being able to move uh, is, is just so crucial. So one of the presentations we had this morning at the forum was on globalization. And when you look at this Great Lakes region as a whole and using a factor of one uh, in terms of the business that this region does together for the rest of the world, you know, they do 40 times more trade, um, you know, between the eight states and the two provinces um, than with the rest of the world. So when that border is not working, um, it's really hurting this region in, in, in a big way and in ultimately having a significant impact on the success and competitiveness of both Canada and the United States. So there are still some, some legacy issues that remain at the border, and we need to find a way of, of coming up with a new vision, a strategy for the border that is making um, uh, the, the flow of people and goods secure, but also as free-flowing as possible. Heather, when you make that argument to political leaders in New York State that we need the border thinner for all of the reasons you just described, what kind of pushback do you get? Well, I, I think that it's interesting because the political leaders in the state, frankly, a lot of times are looking at what's going on in the state and not thinking about the relationship uh, with the, you know our other states or or our neighbors uh, in Canada, and getting them to focus on issues like um, ease of access to, um, to to move goods across the border um, is is not necessarily always on their radar. Um, I, I, I would actually, with a little asterisk there, say that um, our current governor, Kathy Hochul, is from Buffalo, and she's very well aware of the importance of the relationship on the other side of the border. Um, so hopeful that when she, um, it, it, you know, we expect that she will likely be governor in January and she'll have her official first term. Um, that this is something that will be squarely on her radar. You say official first term because, of course, she took over after Andrew Cuomo resigned, so she's in the midst of, I guess, finishing off his term before getting elected to one of her own. But, Mark, pick up the story there, if you would. You know, Fort Erie and Buffalo, Niagara Falls, New York, Niagara Falls, Ontario. I mean, we've got a lot of border towns that uh, rely on one another. How, are, how have they handled the pandemic over the last couple of years? Pandemic has been really tough. Um, I think for a lot of those border towns, where they haven't seen that back and forth of, of families and, and travel uh, for, for travel or for business, for leisure, um, it's been really, really tough. And obviously businesses have been impacted because, uh, you know, you know mo more or less, I think goods have moved across the border and those essential those essential goods have moved across the border, but they, they certainly have been impacted in a, in a big way. And so I think increasingly, you know, mayors on the, in, on the border region, mayors in the Great Lakes region writ large, I think, are, you know, really do understand the importance of this region and are starting to talk about the regional economy even more. And the importance of, uh, of the Great Lakes Economic Forum is that we're trying to get state governors in those conversations as well, you know, state and provincial legislators, uh, you know, federal legislators, as well within Congress. Um, so they understand the relationship much better in this region. And, and more importantly, where do we go for the next uh, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years in terms of that economic partnership? Because as Heather said, there just isn't that level of understanding and that knowledge in terms of what is the state of play today, but what more we could be doing together to make this relationship, this region, even more successful and sustainable. Heather, let me do one more question to you on the issue of border towns, because uh, I suspect there are people watching or listening to us right now who think that there is terrific competition, say, between the two Niagara Falls or between Buffalo and Fort Erie. You know, where are you going to buy your gas? Where are you going to get your groceries? Uh, you know, where are you going to leave on a flight? All of that kind of stuff. Competition between border towns, is that the way we should be looking at this issue? Probably not. I think that, you know, there's a, there's a line that it, that is the border, but essentially the economies on either side are very similar. Um, and so sometimes good comes from competition, but I think generally speaking, they should be viewed as more cohesive communities. Um, and that is something that will help sort of drive better policy.
Gotcha. Okay, you two are both at this Great Lakes Economic Forum conference in Chicago right now. And, um, you know, Mark, again, for, a, for an audience that is not specialized in this issue, give us some of the takeaways you hope to get out of this conference. Well, I think the big takeaway is that uh, globalization today is not what it's been over the last uh, 10, 20 years. Um, and I think there's a recognition that there's a lot more that we as a region can be doing together. There's a lot more that we could be doing in North America, so between Canada, the United States, and Mexico, uh, to really have a reset of an economic vision and strategy in terms of how we're going to succeed together. Uh, we share so many sectors and industries and supply chains. Uh, we have workforce uh, moving back and forth across the border. We do innovation together. You know, we need to be sharing more uh, energy ideas together in terms of that clean energy transition. So the forum is really a place to have these critical conversations to create that understanding and those relationships. And hopefully, um, you know, coming out of the forum, uh, really those visions and strategies and actions that we need to be undertaking together to to really elevate uh, the economic relationship in this region. So it's part ed education, it's part relationship building, and it's part, you know, sort of how do we take action together, recognizing that the federal government has to be there, states and provinces and mayors have to be there, businesses leaders have to be there, as well as many others to, to tackle some of these big uh, challenges, but also opportunities that we're facing. Heather, I'm going to ask this question delicately, but I'm going to ask it anyway, and I'm sure you've heard it before. I'm not sure there's been a time in my lifetime when more Canadians look south of the border and scratch their head wondering what in the hell is going on in your country right now. And I don't just mean Donald Trump or Joe Biden, depending on what side of the political spectrum you're on. They see a Supreme Court decision that changed things the way, have gone, the way they have gone for the last 50 years. They see a country where m there are more guns than people. I mean, there's a lot of things about the states right now that just a lot of Canadians find very concerning. In which case, how do you want to make the case that our countries really need to be closer together in, in many ways when right now, I know we're looking at you much more suspiciously than we ever have. Yeah, I, I mean, I could hardly blame anyone for scratching their heads right now. I think a lot of um, a, a lot of us in, in the states are scratching our own heads as well, and it just shows that we have to do something about political polarization and the sort of um, back and forth of of some really extreme politics. Um, that is going to be a, a long project, and I, you know I think that I, I wouldn't blame anyone for for wondering what the heck is going on. All of that being said, um, if we can take a regional approach to solving economic issues, um, I think that would go a long way to showing that we can work together on other more difficult political issues. Mark, I'll put the same question to you. I mean, how would you make the case to a Canadian audience that, given everything that's been going on in the United States for the past five or six years, that this is a place that we ought to get either economically or culturally closer to? Well, I think it's fair to say that we are so intertwined on a number of different levels economically, and we've built that relationship over time. It certainly can get deeper you know, in a number of different sectors. You know, we talk a lot about the auto sector. That's a traditional area where we've got those strong connections. But, you know, aviation, space technology, uh, agriculture, agri-food, uh, life sciences and healthcare. Um, there's a lot more we could be doing to create economic success and growth in this region. But we also have to admit that when we're trying to build those economic connections that will, that will support both sides of the border, there are a lot of people in this region, I think more broadly in North America, who unfortunately feel left out and left behind by this 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 uh, fast-paced, uh, you know, sort of new and emerging economy. And and we need to really be, uh, uh, you know, upfront and honest about the fact that, you know, from an economic uh, mobility standpoint, from an equity standpoint, uh, we need to address those underlying issues uh, because there is tension, there is frustration, there is people who are feeling left out, and it's creating a bit of that anger which when you add social media into that conversation, uh, it just makes it uh, extremely difficult to deal with. So if we deepen the relationship, we get the economics right, uh, and we start really trying to understand the fact that there are lots of people who are being left out in this, this shifting economy, 
um, you know, I think it can be a really productive relationship uh, for the for the longer term. But we have to really address these these uh, these really stark issues, uh, you know, up front and um, and uh, and to be able to do that together on both sides of the border, which is why, again, the forum is so important for us. OK, Heather, in which case, give us give us a one policy change you'd like to see happen that you think would improve the economic relationship among the Great Lakes states and provinces. All right, I'll, I'll give you my favorite one because I, I'm a very, very big Buffalo Bills fan, but I, I think having the states collaborate in the, in the region, get together and figure out how to really make a plan for high-speed rail, connecting Toronto, Montreal, Detroit, um, Chicago, Albany, um, upstate New York to downstate New York, I think that it could be transformative. It's sort of a fantasy. Um, I know it would be a lot. It would require a lot of political cooperation um, and agreement that this is a good idea. But um, I think we've seen how transformative having advanced transportation can be. And I think this is something that could really transform the region. Do you think our governments have, are capable of that kind of collaboration in order to make that, you know, it's a wonderful idea, but it would be a hugely ambitious project come to fruition. I, I mean, I think that they have to at least start considering it. It's not going to happen on its own, certainly. And um, but but we need to start putting things like this on the table. What can we do as a region? I think climate, you know, climate addressing climate change is another thing that is better as a regional approach rather than each individual state or or provincial government. Now, when you talked about exports from New York State to, let's say, the province of Ontario earlier, were you including the Buffalo Bills on that list? Because I know there are a lot of people who'd be happy to have the Bills come up here. No way, man. No way. <laughs> just checking. Okay, just checking. Uh, Mark, we're down to our last minute here, and I just wanted to ask you, what's perhaps the least known factoid, for lack of a better word, about the Great Lakes region that you think people should know? Oh, that's a tough question, Steve. Um, I would say that 25% of all trade between the United States and Canada goes across one bridge, and that's the Ambassador Bridge between uh, Detroit, uh, Michigan, and Windsor, Ontario. Um, that's one quarter of all trade between uh, between both countries. So that is a vital corridor, and that's obviously why so many people were concerned in the business community when the Ambassador Bridge was shut down, but also why the Gordy Howe Bridge, which is being constructed now, is is so important. So that's I think that's one factoid that a lot of people overlook is just the the sheer size of the economic relationship, but the amount of trade that just goes across one bridge between uh, between both countries and in Michigan and Ontario. That may explain why the convoy, the trucker convoy, got cleared so quickly. Uh, by the Ambassador Bridge in a way that did not take place in downtown Ottawa. But again, that's another story for another day. Uh, Heather Mulligan and Mark Fisher, we're really glad both of you could spend some time with us on TVO tonight. Enjoy the conference, and we'll be in touch as it continues. Thank you. Thank you. Last week, inflation hit levels unseen since Brian Mulroney was leader of the Progressive Conservative Party of Canada and Brian Adams was at the top of the pop charts. As it did in 1983, it means paying more for essential goods from food to gasoline and housing. Here on what's causing the problem and whether anyone anyone has the tools to fix it. Let's welcome, in Chicago, Illinois, economist Mike Moffat, senior director at the Smart Prosperity Institute think tank and an assistant professor at Western University's Ivy Business School. In the nation's capital, Armin Yalnesian, economist and Atkinson fellow on the future of workers. And here in our studio, Craig Alexander, chief economist and executive advisor at Deloitte Canada. And we're delighted to welcome you three back onto our program tonight, even if the subject matter is rather depressing and let's just show a chart off the top here just to show everybody where things are at in terms of inflation in Canada if we go back to 2019 the annual inflation rate in the country was below 2% 1.9 in 2020 it was below 1% 0.7% in 2021 3.4% as covid started to take root and in may of 2022 the annualized inflation rate in Canada is 7.7%. Okay, Armin, get us started here. COVID-19, supply chain issues, the war in Ukraine, we have heard these issues before. Is there anything you want to add to that list in terms of why inflation is suddenly out of control? <laughs> 
I think uh, in Canada, we noticed that in the last month, we were returning also not only to the basics of food, shelter, and gas uh, rising because of all of the things you just said, but also there was a new discretionary element, which is people deciding that COVID is over and wanting to party. And so both flights and hotels, all that recreational stuff pushed the difference between the previous month and this month's inflation uh, more rapidly than we have seen since the summer of 2020 when everybody wanted to renovate their houses because they couldn't go anywhere and softwood lumber was the discretionary uh, part of inflation. This is really troubling because food, shelter and gas are non-discretionary and there is nothing on the horizon showing us how that might be modulated except for the Fed hikes, the central bank hikes that will definitely cool the that part of the market, but uh, won't make food or gas any more uh, accessible and affordable to especially low-income Canadians. Mike Moffat, same question. What would you add to the original list? Yeah, so I'd also add uh, refinery capacity. We had a number of refineries uh, shut down in the United States during COVID that haven't reopened yet. Because we've seen oil prices this high before. They were this high eight years ago, but we didn't have two bucks a liter gas back then. And that's been part of the issue that uh, normally the spread on a refinery is about 10 to $15 a barrel between the difference of uh, a barrel of oil and refined products. That's now up to the 45 to $60 a barrel range. So that's one of the things that's uh, causing drivers to pay more, but those oil prices and high gas prices percolate through the economy because, you know, shipping and, and other things like that. So that is, uh, I think, an underrated driver of that. And as uh, the Biden administration looks to get some of those refineries open again, that should uh, eat some inflationary pressures. Craig, your take. Well, I think the, the really notable element is how broad based it actually is. Um, what we're seeing is rising prices in, in absolutely every category, including elements um, that typically you don't see price pressures. So, for example, uh, clothing and footwear are often a category where we see very low price inflation, uh, often discounting, and yet you're, you're still seeing price, prices rising there at more than 2%. And then, as, as already mentioned, you have the staple goods where you're seeing very, very strong price gains, uh, including food and energy and, and, and real staples. And I think the real concern from a point of view of the central banks is how it's broadening out. And what we're really seeing is it, it's, it's, it's coming both on the, on the supply side and the demand side. And I think that's also the source of concern. Initially, what we saw was the ramp up in, in, in inflation started off on the supply side because of the, the breaking down of uh, supply chains during the, the pandemic. And central banks said, OK, that's temporary, that's transitory, that will pass. But then we started to see some demand side pressure starting to build. And then we got a second supply shock from the war in Ukraine. And what that really did was broaden out the inflation and uh, the inflationary pressures mm -hmm. that really forced the central banks to say, OK, we can't wait. You've uh, kind of anticipated my follow up question for Mike, which is when inflation seems to take root, it also seems to be very difficult to control once it starts rising. It just seems to go and go and go. Why is that? Well, we tend to see these inflationary spirals. That if you think prices are going to go up five to ten percent in the next year, you're going to buy that car now or that dishwasher now. You're not going to let your money depreciate. So, uh, expectations of future inflation tend to cause inflation today, and I think that's why it's going to be so important for our central banks around the world and our governments to uh, address this issue, get those expectations under control. Because in economics, we do see a lot of these self-fulfilling prophecies, and this is certainly one of those. Okay. And in which case, Armin, earlier this uh, month, the Federal Reserve in the United States raised the interest rates by 0.75. Do you think the Bank of Canada should do the same? Start us off on that. Well, our inflation rate is not as accelerated as in the United States. Nobody does extreme like the U.S. So 0.75, like 75 basis points is what they're going to do. Will we do the same? I would be surprised if we went that far, but it depends on how the central bank is reading uh, the tea leaves right now. We've already seen a cooling in the housing market. They know that that's the only part of the market that they can affect. Rising interest rates are going to do nothing about planting crops. 
in uh, the world to make sure that the food supply and the food shortages don't trickle into commodity prices. Rising prices aren't going to do anything about opening up refineries or increasing the amount of oil being shipped per day. So really the only part of the inflation puzzle that central banks can, can um, affect is the housing market, and we are already seeing early signs of that. So will they double down? Um, I don't know, but because uh, I'm not a central banker. But uh, <laughs> if I was a central banker, I'd be very worried about the tightrope we are all walking. You know, all the central banks are working in lockstep across Euro the European Union, in the United States, in Canada. And that tightrope is... Um, you cool down growth too much because that's all rising rates can do is cool demand. You cool down demand too much and you risk triggering a recession. The United States already had a quarter of contraction. We don't know if they're heading into a second quarter, which is the technical definition of a recession. The only good news in this story um, is that we are sitting on record, like half century low unemployment rates. So even if you cool demand in the form of uh, not hiring as many people or even possibly laying some people off, the tightness in our labor markets we haven't seen for half a century, and that will maintain purchasing power and bargaining power to some extent, which is exactly what you want. You don't want to stifle um, demand to the point where you've got a recession. I was going to ask Craig about that. How unusual is it to have both high inflation and high employment at the same time? Well, you you often have the, the combination because usually what you have is, you know, tightness in the labor market can create some of the inflationary impulse. But in point of fact, we sh I should emphasize that we're not seeing wages actually driving inflation this time around. Um, yes, wages have picked up. We've seen wages in Canada um, increase. So if we look at the last monthly number, wage growth had reached 3.9%. But and, and but if you actually look at what's happened to the composition of job creation in Canada, more of the jobs being created um, coming out of the pandemic were higher paying jobs. So if you adjust for the occupations that were being created and you you uh, you adjust for that effect, wage growth has probably been really around three percent certainly not inflationary. So the inflation we're getting actually isn't coming because of the tightness in the labor market causing wages being bid up, leading employers to pass along the higher cost of labor uh, to, to consumers. So what's, what's really happened is on the supply side, because of those supply, um, supply chain dislocations caused by uh, the breaking down of supply chains during the pandemic that Canadians are very familiar with when they went to the stores and found that they, you know, they couldn't find what they wanted on the shelves. Or, you know, if you went to the auto dealers and found that there was no new cars for sale because there weren't computer chips for the, for the production of new vehicles, you know, that, that meant that used car prices went through the roof, right? So you had supply side price effects. On the demand side, I think a lot of the, the demand uh, price, price effects came from the, the rebound in demand, partly because of the massive um, income transfers that took place during the pandemic. So, you know, we had a big unemployment shock, like lots of Canadians lost their jobs. Labor compensation during the pandemic fell in 2020, labor compensation fell 1%. Household disposable income increased 9%. Hmm. And that was a reflection of the massive government transfers that took place. So personal savings increased a lot, partly because of government transfers, but also because Canadians couldn't spend money the way they wanted to. They couldn't buy, they couldn't go to restaurants. They couldn't, they couldn't go to movie theaters. So typically Canadian households save 25 to $35 billion in aggregate a year. Over the, the two years of 2020-2021, they saved $360 billion. Hmm. And that vast amount of money is basically giving them a pool of money that they could spend. And, and what that means is that as prices have been rising, Canadians have spent. Now, I don't want to be, you know, I don't want to be, you know, flippant about this. Like, for a lot of low-income Canadians, this high inflation has been punishing. Right? But for other Canadians that saved a lot during the recession, they could, you know, they could afford higher prices. And that's partly the demand effect.
I think probably two thirds of the inflation we've been seeing is on the supply side. About a third has been on, on the mm -hmm. demand side. Well, let me add, uh, Mike, something else to the list that we hear frequently, which is to say the CERB, the amount of government spending that took place, the quantitative easing that took place, a fancy way for saying, I guess, priming the pump and having the government get, uh, get much more actively involved in economic growth and development. Uh, we right. saw that kind of thing take place during the Great Recession of 2008, and yet we did not get the associated inflation that we're getting this time. How come it happened this time and it didn't happen last time? Well, I, I think a couple of things that I think part of it is just the, the size of it. Uh, in 2008 and 2009, uh, both fiscal policy and monetary policy didn't respond strongly enough. So we had a number of years of, of weak growth. And, uh, you know, uh, people who run central banks are a little bit like uh, military generals, that there's this tendency to fight the last war. So I think we probably erred on the side of doing too much this time because we did too little uh, last time. So I certainly think, uh, you know, the level of quantitative easing did play a role. But, you know, it, it was an unprecedented circumstance. We hadn't been in a situation like this in, in over 100 years. There's really no playbook. So uh, central banks around the world were trying to sort of figure out, uh, you know, the level of monetary stimulus to put into the system to make everything work. And, you know, I, I think it's fair to say that maybe they did go a little too far. Uh, OK, you're not the only one who's been saying that. But having uh, having said that, uh, I think, Armin, it's fair to say you couldn't find an economist back during the Great Recession uh, or even now who said that, for example, creating the uh, emergency response benefit was a bad thing to do. The government had to intervene in order to protect people from the worst ravages of this. And yet now we're getting runaway inflation in a way we didn't have when the Great Recession hit back in 2008. Can you add anything to what Mike just said about why that would be? Well, quantitative easing is something central banks do. So CERB wasn't something that the central banks did. That was fiscal policy, and that was meant to... Frankly, it wasn't meant to sustain purchasing power in the sense of... in the sense that Craig was talking about. It was to contain the contagion. Make sure people that, especially those that had been knocked out of low-paying jobs, weren't scrambling to do other jobs. So we didn't, con you know, contaminate everybody. You know, that, like at, at the beginning of this pandemic, we were actually trying to save one another from the contagion. We're not there anymore, but that's what CERB was about. And that isn't quantitative easing. That was a measure taken to contain the contagion. And nobody said, don't do that, uh, because it made perfect sense. Frankly, um, Canada was really well placed internationally because everybody did wage subsidies to employers to keep people on payroll. Canada was the one of the very few countries I can't think of, actually of another one that introduced that kind of automatic ro robot. You know, you apply for it, you get two thousand dollars spit out at you, and then we'll deal with it later on. It was uh, just basically, if you need the money, apply for it and stay at home. And that particular approach in combination with the wage subsidies, which did not turn out to be quite as effective in keeping people connected to payroll when the pandemic was over, um, that particular approach meant that we finished uh, the labor market impacts of the pandemic in October of 2021. Uh, we're now at 117% of the labor market of the pre-pandemic period because our population has grown. The United States is still struggling to get back to pre-pandemic headcounts of jobs. So it was a really good thing for um, minimizing the depth and duration of the labor market impact. And I think that can only be a good thing, uh, especially in an era of population aging where you're getting more exits from than entrance to the labor market, not just in Canada, but in the United States, in Europe, throughout the global north. That's the era that we are in. And um, everybody is dealing with tight labor markets, certainly not just Canada. There, There is a link, though, between the, the quantitative easing and the fiscal response during the, the pandemic, though, right? Because... In effect, what happened was the, the, the government provided massive fiscal support for workers that absolutely had to happen, right? Governments effectively turned off large parts of the economy. And if they're going to do that, they had to provide support to businesses and, and households to help them get through the, 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 the terrible times 
that they had, you know, engineered for the right reasons to, to deal with the health risks. So you had massive uh, income transfers to households and businesses. The, 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 the Bank of Canada embarked on massive quantitative easing, buying Government of Canada bonds. And if you, you look at the quantitative easing that was done, the amount of Government of Canada bonds that were purchased was roughly equivalent to the total size of the federal government deficit in the first year of, of the pandemic, right? And the money supply that was created by the quantitative easing, right, was that money was put into the Canadian economy. Now, the difference between the Great Recession of, you know, the, the financial crisis of 0809 and and the, the pandemic experience, like in Canada, we didn't have quantitative easing during the 08, 09 financial crisis, but the US did. The difference there is that when, when you study economics, they, they, in first year economics, they tell you if you increase the money supply, you'll increase inflation. Um, in second year economics, they tell you that's not true. <laughs> uh, what matters is if you increase the money supply as it circulates, through the economy, it'll drive up prices. And the circulation of money is absolutely critical. So what happened during the Great Recession and the financial crisis of 2009 was in Europe and in the United States where they did quantitative easing, they increased the amount of money by buying all these bonds, but because of the damage done to the financial system, the money didn't circulate. It sat, sat in bank vaults because the, the banking system was being recapitalized. Mm. This time around, the money was effectively transferred to households through fiscal policy, and, that, and some of that money did indeed flow. Now, a lot of it went into savings, but some of it did flow. And that contributed to the demand. It contributed to the strong economic recovery that we've had. So, the, so there is a link here. But the important, but, but as, I, as I tried to, to stress, that, in, that contributed to inflation, but it hasn't been the dominant driver of inflation, right? The, the supply side has still been the dominant mm -hmm. driver. Demand has been a component of it, but the supply side has been the dominant driver. Well, Mike, the thing I'm trying to figure out here is that it's a, it's a tradition that central bankers will, of course, raise interest rates to tackle inflation. That's usually the thing they do. Uh, but nobody wants us to go into recession, uh, which, which sometimes happens when they raise interest rates. So my question is, should we have confidence in the people responsible for doing this that they will be able to raise interest rates enough to tackle inflation but not too much to cause a housing crash or a recession that's absolutely the challenge here i think it was armin earlier who, who called this a tightrope walking app and it, it absolutely is uh and it, it's it's going to be a challenge for them we don't have a playbook for a situation like this you know the I, other than uh, the last pandemic I, i'm thinking maybe the sort of uh post-war boom after world war ii where you know we we had uh, a bout of inflation then so this is going to be tough uh the bank of canada has uh, some important choices to make and, and probably, frankly, not a lot of faith in their models, given, uh, you know, we weren't predicting two years ago that we'd be in this situation. So um, yeah, I, I'm glad I do what I do. And uh, the bank, can't, you know, and I'm not at the Bank of Canada, because they're going to have to make some really <laughs> tough calls over the next year. Well, okay, Armin, let me get you on that. Should we have confidence that these folks know what they're doing, so that they can fight inflation without sending us into a recession? All central banks have got two jobs. One is to stabilize prices, which they probably won't be able to do very much other than in the housing market. And, you know, watch what you wish for because we might see a price correction if they keep picking it up. Um, the second job that central banks have to do is, as somebody else said, I think it was Mike, uh, to control people's expectations about prices. And that's what they're working on right now, is controlling our expectations that they are, in fact, doing everything that can be done through a central bank to stabilize prices. But everybody knows that nothing about higher interest rates is going to do anything about the food and the gas problems that we have that are global. The fact of the matter is Mike has now said twice that there's no playbook for this. And indeed, central banks do not have a playbook for dealing with exogenous supply shocks, such as war and such as pandemic, 
and such as extreme climate events. And we're in a world now where all of these things are unfolding at the same time, plus population aging, which is likely to, you know, we do have tight labor markets. We're not at the end of this process of population aging yet. So tight labor markets are with us for a while to come. Will that mean that wage growth does accelerate as it should in tight labor markets? Or will our public policies doing things like opening the floodgates for temporary foreign workers you know, subdue wage growth. We don't know, that chapter ain't been written yet. So <laughs> there's a lot of stuff happening. And really the best the central banks can do is moderate demand for housing because it's so interest rate specific and moderate our expectations that the people that can do the job are doing the best they can. It's really about the credibility of the central banks at some yeah. level right now too. Yeah. Craig, do you worry about a housing crash? I, I, ex I firmly expect we're going to see a correction in Canadian home prices. We saw um, national average home prices went up 33% during the, the pandemic, 40% on average in Ontario. Um, with interest rates coming up, I, I don't think it's a question if we're going to see a, home, a, a, a correction in home prices. I think just the Bank of Canada has told us that they're going to take policy interest rates to what they think is neutral, and that means an overnight rate of at least 3%. And, and we're currently at 1.5%. So we have another, at a minimum, we have another one and a half percentage point increase to go just for them to get to what they would consider to be neutral. And I think that's enough to cause home prices to pull back. And homeowners won't like that answer, but you know, I think home prices went too far and home housing affordability is, is an enormous problem. Hmm. Um, and I think that from the point of view of, you know, um, you know, I think the Bank of Canada has incredibly talented people. I have. I think they are the best in the business when it comes to running monetary policy. I just think they have an enormously difficult task ahead of them. Um, I think that it, it is all about managing expectations. I think they know that they can't man. They they can't manage the the supply side of the equation. But, but they, they need to cool down the demand side. And I think they're going to they're gonna walk that, that fine line. I personally think the biggest risk in terms of the economic outlook for Canada and the recession risk is actually what happens coming out of the United States. I think the U.S. economy is overheating more than Canada. And I think there's probably bigger risks that the U.S. Uh, raises rates too aggressively and if the U.S. goes into a recession, I think it'll pull down Canada as well. As it always does. So I would, I would keep, as much as I would keep an eye on what the Bank of Canada is doing, I would, I would keep an eye on what the U.S. Federal Reserve is doing just as much. Okay. Armin, um, w with a little over five minutes to go here, let me raise another issue with everybody, and that is market consolidation. And I guess one of the bigger examples of that right now is Rogers attempting to buy Shaw. We're talking about massive multi-billion dollar mergers here and so on. It's happening in other sectors as well. Fewer players in more sectors often leads to higher prices for consumers. And I wonder how much of that is part of the story we've been talking about tonight. What an excellent question. Uh, we saw a wave of corporate consolidation in the wake of the 2008-9 Great Recession, as you put it. Uh, the collapse of the global financial order made borrowing money the cheapest it's ever been in history. And so there were a number of big players with deep pockets that borrowed money to buy out their competitors. And we're seeing another wave of that right now, uh, where pandemic economics have actually filled coffers. And there are a handful, you, you mentioned uh, the telecommunications sector, which has historically been marked by um, an oligopoly, just a small number of players that set prices. It's happening in food. It's happening in auto, it's happening in mining, it is happening in wheat, it is happening in more and more sectors. And this is something that we absolutely need the Competition Bureau to expand its arm of regulation to being a consumer ad advocate. And we don't have a consumer advocacy body in this country and haven't since, I don't know, I, I don't know if we had one in the 60s, but certainly we are at a moment where um, price setting is the norm for too many industries and uh, affordability is in part 
all the supply chain issues we've been talking about, also lagging wage growth, but also the ability of large players setting the price on what we consume. And that can't, that can't last. Mike, how do we know whether prices are going up because of worldwide inflation and the influence of that versus uh, some mischievous corporate citizens who are taking advantage of that situation and knocking the prices up and blaming international factors when in fact mm -hmm. it's, how do I put this delicately, when it maybe is their greed that's, that's calling the shots instead? Yeah, well, it, it's absolutely uh, some of both. And I think, the, you know, our means right when it comes to uh, corporate concentration. Uh, if you have a very competitive market, uh, what should happen in a market in a situation like this where there's a lot of uh, input uh, price rises is uh, competitive. Competitors will figure out how to become more efficient to try and gain market share. But if there's only two or three companies in a market, they don't really have to do that. They don't need to sort of focus on those efficiencies and instead pass those uh, higher input costs along to consumers. So this is a, a big body of research right now. It seems that every day uh, a, a new central bank or a new academic comes out with a paper on this. Um, but I think we are starting to, to recognize the importance of market structure on both uh, the causes of inflation, but also the factors that can uh, drive prices back down. Well, okay, Craig, pick up on that if you would. I mean, people are talking about gas, all, gas prices all the time these days. Uh, I don't know what you were doing in Burlington, but I know people here in uh, the capital city were spending two twenty dollars a litre on gas, and now suddenly, all of a sudden, it's down below two. It happened in a week. How does that happen? <laughs> you want me to explain the <laughs> volatility in gas prices? <laughs> Um, well, how much of how much of the 220 was inflation, and how much of it was oil companies taking advantage of what everybody understood to be a volatile situation? Yeah, I, look, I mean, there's when when you're looking at at the movements in 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 prices, there's there's going to be shifts because of what's happening to, to changes in input input costs, and then there's and then there's going to be what companies are doing with margins. And I would, I would say that one of the things I would highlight is I, I, I do think that, that as inflation became a, 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 a bigger issue, you create an inflation mindset that suddenly actually gives businesses some pricing power, right? Mm -hmm. Like, so in a sense, consumers become conditioned to actually expect higher prices, right? And what that, what, that, what that actually does is it actually gives businesses some ability to, to, to increase prices when otherwise they, they wouldn't. Have they right? no shame? Well, <laughs> it's, you know, the, the, market, the market price is what the person will pay, right? And there are products, you know, there are products that are essential products, right? So there are things that people have to buy. But, but there are also products that people buy because they, they want to purchase them and they have, they have a choice, right? And this is, this, is, this, is, this is why, you know, part of the reason why I brought up that huge pool of savings because, you know, in some cases, I think consumers are looking at the prices and saying, you know, the, 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 one of the things that, that strikes me is, you know, we have very, very rapid inflation you know, inflation in, in, in May was 7.7%. Wages are going up at 3.9%, at right? So inflation's almost 8%. Wages are only going up at half that. Everyone's fine. I look at, I look at, I look at credit card borrowing. Credit card borrowing fell during the pandemic and is only creeping higher at the moment. So... How, how is retail spending actually not declining, right? Why is, why, why, are retail, why is retail spending proving resilient right now? I should, like, in, in volume terms, after I strip, off, strip out prices, why am I not seeing the volume of retail spending falling because people can't afford to make purchases, right? And, and it's, it, it, it obviously, the, 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 the answer is that that, 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 that pool of savings is getting absorbed by businesses raising prices, and that's showing up in corporate profits, right? So you can, you can look at the corporate profits and you can say, look, 
those, those businesses are being greedy. But you can also ask the question, you know, those corporate profits aren't being created out of thin air. Where are they coming from? They are being right? influenced by the behavior of consumers. They're, they're for being sure. behavior. They're, they're coming from from consumers. Mm -hmm. Now, right. now, if if it's coming from market concentration, which 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 was where you you started this, right? Every you know, like we believe in competition, right? Like m businesses should compete, and competition, you know, com you know, open competition. Creates creates you know vibrant markets. It creates good you know creates productivity. It drives efficiency. It drives economic growth. It creates jobs. Right? Monopolies are not something you want. Right? So they create they breed inefficiencies. So I'm I'm strongly in favor of our means our means recommendations around you know strong co competition policy and and ensuring that we have very competitive markets. So would you vote th right? thumbs down on the Roger Shaw merger? I know uh, that's, that's another that's, show. That's, that, that's not that's not my position to say. <laughs> but, that's but, another but, show. But in yeah. but 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 out, no, without without getting into company names, yeah. the, the the bottom line is we need healthy competition policy in the country, um, and I and I and I and I do think, but but I, but I also do think that that the the issue we have right is is a is is a bit of like I do think that that profit margins are being boosted. By the fact that consumers are getting conditioned by the inflation environment, mm. and I think the Bank of Canada deflating inflation, you know, deflating some, like taking some of the wind out of the economy, will actually deal deal part 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 of that. As we always say, to be continued. Mm -hmm. uh, thanks everybody for your participation here on TVO tonight. Mike Moffat, Armin Yalnesian, Craig Alexander. Great to see you three again. Appreciate it very much. And that is the agenda for Monday, June 27th, 2022. Tomorrow, we'll return to the Great Lakes Economic Forum to find out about efforts to mitigate climate change across the region. And we hope you'll be with us for that. I'm Steve Pakin. Thanks for watching TVO, for joining us online at tvo.org, and we'll see you again tomorrow. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism.